And so the archaeological evidence, it's against the Exodus happening in the 15th century, which is a date that's alluded to in the literal interpretation of Exodus 1 verse 11. And so since this date doesn't work, scholars have tried to fit the Exodus into the 13th century. And so let's see if the evidence supports um, uh, this this time frame by continuing in the book right here, the Bible on earth by Dr. Israel Finkelstein and Dr. Neil Asher Silverman to see if we can get some understanding. Only in recent years has it become clear that from the time of the new kingdom onward, beginning after the expulsion of the Hiskos, the Egyptians tightened their control over the flow of immigrants from Canaan into the Delta. The Hyksos, they came from Canaan and they gradually migrated into Egypt and they took over. And eventually the Egyptians, they banded together and they overthrew the Hyksos rulership and they got them out of there, right? And so the Egyptians, they learned a very valuable lesson from this and they improved their immigration policies. They established a system of forts along the Delta's eastern border and manned them with garrison troops and administrators. The Nile Delta is right here on the map. And so here is the proximity to the land of Canaan or, or Israel. And so they set up troops in this area. So keep this in mind. A late 13th century papyrus records how closely the commanders of the forts monitored the movements of foreigners. In the 13th century is when people would like to point to the Israelites making an exodus out of Egypt. And so the movement of foreigners uh, in this Delta area was closely monitored by the Egyptians during this time. And so here is an, an example of one record. We have completed the entry of the tribes of the Edomite Shasu, that is Bedouin, through the fortress of Merneta content with truth, which is Juku to the poles of Per Itum, which are in Juku for the sustenance of their flocks. The Egyptians were on it at this time, right, with their documentation. Let's get some more. The border between Canaan and Egypt was thus closely controlled. If a great mass of fleeing Israelites have passed through the border fortifications of the Pharaonic regime, a record should exist. In other words, if the Egyptians documented the Edomite tribes and their flocks, then they surely would have documented the more than 600,000 people fleeing from Egypt as described in the Bible. And so the Egyptians, they were meticulous record keepers, but somehow they managed not to document anything whatsoever about the most impactful uh, event to have ever taken place. And so the question is, does this seem reasonable to you? Yet in the abundant Egyptian sources describing the time of the new kingdom in general and the 13th century in particular, there was no reference to the Israelites, not even a single clue. The firstborn of man and beast were supposedly killed. The Nile turned into blood, darkness for three days, someone splitting the sea and then walking people through it and more than 600,000 people escaped from Egypt. Yet the Egyptians, who were record keepers, they just decided that it wasn't important enough to write any of this stuff down at all. We know of nomadic groups from Edom who entered Egypt from the desert. I mean, they thought that it was important to record something as seemingly petty as the entry of the Edomites and their uh, flock, but all the wild plagues, all the deaths, all the people that got up and left, nope. That wasn't important at all to record in the history books. And so this only makes sense to someone who's not thinking properly and someone who's not in their right mind. And so this is what religion will do to people. It clouds the intellectual faculty and it doesn't allow it to function properly, uh, especially when dealing with something that should be in otherwise simple to reason out. The Merneptah steel refers to Israel as a group of people already living in Canaan. So the Egyptians knew about the Israelites around this time and they wrote about them. But they knew of these people as already living in Canaan. And there's a good reason for this, as we'll see in later commentaries. But we have no clue, not even a single word, about early Israelites in Egypt. Neither in monumental inscriptions on walls of temples, nor in tomb inscriptions, nor in papyri. They don't find them referenced in Egypt on anything at all. And so as much as they uh, claim that they did in Egypt, you're telling me that they're not found on anything to verify these claims? I mean, it's got to be at least a little bit that they're found on, right? A little bit. Israel is absent as a possible foe of Egypt, as a friend, or as an enslaved nation. What is absent is the physical evidence. But where all the evidence is present is in the world of imagination, right? Where you can find all the evidence that you want for the Israelites being slaves in Egypt, for Moses parting the Red Sea, Right. All the plagues in Egypt and all the people leaving out without the Egyptians taking any record whatsoever or mentioning mentioning them on anything. 
right? And so in the world of imagination, you can make it to where uh, even God made the Egyptians forget all the things that happened as the reason why they didn't write anything down, right? I mean, you can make up anything that you want and anything that your mind can create, and it'll be true for you as soon as you start to believe it. And there are simply no finds in Egypt that can be directly associated with the notion of a distinct foreign ethnic group, as opposed to a concentration of migrant workers from many places living in a distinct area of the Eastern Delta, as implied by the biblical account of the children of Israel living together in the land of Goshen. Come on with it. There is something more, the escape of more than a tiny group from Egyptian control at the time of Ramses II seems highly unlikely, as in the crossing of the desert and entry into Canaan. A tiny group escaping from the hands of Ramses II was highly unlikely, let alone a massive group of 600,000 people. And so listen closely to one of the major reasons why. In the 13th century, Egypt was at the peak of its authority, the dominant power in the world. This is when Egypt was at the top of their game. The Egyptian grip over Canaan was firm. Egyptian strongholds were built in various places in the country, and Egyptian officials administered the affairs of the region. You see that? They had a python grip on Canaan, and they were in uh, control of that region. Now look how strong they were right here. In the El Armana letters, which are dated a century before, we are told that a unit of 50 Egyptian soldiers was big enough to pacify unrest in Canaan. Only 50 soldiers were required to make the people in Canaan uh, take a seat when they got out of line. And so this is how strong they were relative to the people of Canaan at that time. And throughout the period of the New Kingdom, large Egyptian armies marched through Canaan to the north, as far as the Euphrates in Syria. The New Kingdom is from the 16th to the 11th century BCE, and so they stomped all through those territories without a worry in the world, right, and doing exactly what they wanted to do. They were that powerful. Therefore, the main overland road that went from the Delta along the coast of northern Sinai to Gaza and then into the heart of Canaan was of utmost importance to the Pharaonic regime. The most potentially vulnerable stretch of the road, which crossed the arid and dangerous desert of northern Sinai between the Delta and Gaza, was the most protected. Putting aside the possibility of divinely inspired miracles, one can hardly accept the idea of a flight of a large group of slaves from Egypt through the heavily guarded border fortifications into the desert and then into Canaan in the time of such a formidable Egyptian presence. The one that could hardly accept this idea is talking about someone in their right mind and someone reasoning through the evidence. And so it would be hard to get someone like that to accept the idea. But a, a person who is approaching this from a religious perspective, they could easily make this, uh, make a case for this, right? And I know exactly how this was because I used to approach it in that way at one particular time in my life. Any group escaping Egypt against the will of the Pharaoh would have easily been tracked down not only by an Egyptian army chasing it from the Delta, but also by the Egyptian soldiers in the forts in northern Sinai and in Canaan. Indeed, the biblical narrative hints at the danger of attempting to flee by the coastal route. Thus, the only alternative would be to turn into the desolate waste of the Sinai Peninsula. But the possibility of a large group of people wandering in the Sinai Peninsula is also contradicted by archaeology. And so the Exodus, as narrated in the Bible, is not an account that is historically reliable. And as a literal story, it just isn't worth very much. But from a metaphysical interpretation, there's a lot that could be uncovered because what this story veils is how to escape from the pit and cross over into the free world where life is much better and it makes, makes much more sense. Right, and so this is the end of part six commentary on the book here, The Bible Unearthed by Dr. Israel Finkelstein and Dr. Neil Asher Silverman. And I wanna thank you for watching all the way into the end. My name is Brooklyn St. Michael, and I'll see you in the free world.